You're listening to episode seven of the Happy Space Podcast. Today, we're exploring how to calm the open concept office with Nook. Welcome to the Happy Space Podcast, a place where highly sensitive people thrive. Not only will we learn how to better navigate life with our superpowers, we'll find ways to better manage the challenges too. We'll hear from product and service innovators, space designers, and leaders who believe in creating an inclusive, neurologically safe world. If you're highly sensitive or want to better understand and support someone who is, then you are in the right place. I'm your host, Claire Kumar, and I'm so very happy you're here. If you've ever worked in an open concept office, you know the struggle is real from the visual stimulation to the noise to that feeling of just too much exposure. I was so thrilled to discover there are options now that are easy to embed into a workspace to bring that sense of rest and calm. I, you know, I think back on my experience, one of the things I observed even three years ago, I was going downtown Toronto to some tech firms and I was giving a presentation and I noticed when I was leaving in the hallway on the floor in between the two companies that occupied that floor, a woman was sitting working with the the growth of the company and the office being primarily open concept there was such pressure on the meeting rooms that there was no quiet place to work actually in the company's premises so she was sitting in the hallway in between i remember about 11 years ago the, my very first coaching client actually uh he invited me to his office to see where he worked and we would meet in a meeting room but his whole 200 person office was open concept, uh, all of the uh, the individual desks. And I remember remarking on incredible uh, sound dampening, which was amazing. It was not a noisy place. There was a, a lot of uh, soft furnishing, furnishings and ceiling treatments that kept the sound down. But overwhelmingly in that space, it was just a lot of visual stimulation and a sense of being in a sea of people, which was somewhat disturbing, especially depending on where you were placed. Anyway, so you can imagine as you know, I've watched this expansion of the open concept office, science showing that it's not necessarily ideal for many brains to be working in that kind of environment. When I found Nook as a furniture solution, a really flexible furniture solution to give some options for placing that refuge, those quiet places of focus, at the sensory sanctuary, if you will. I was so excited and I'm thrilled to be speaking today with David O'Coyman. He's the director of Nook, which you'll find at nookpod.com. And don't tell me, uh, you know, that didn't go unnoticed uh, that we both added pod to our brand. So happy space happy space pod nook and nookpod.com to uh, have a URL that would roll off the tongue and also embody that feeling of safety that I want to have with the happy space community. And of course, that the nook furniture uh, embodies with the the sense of safety, that sense of sanctuary. This is a, a delightful conversation in which David brings to life the reasons why Nook came to be, why it's so important and timely for our working world right now to uh, have more pre- prevalently included. We, you'll get to hear his very, very important point near the end of the interview. So definitely stay for that. But let me tell you about a little bit about David and why he's uh, well worth listening to. So David joins us today from Amsterdam. He splits his time in between Amsterdam and Bristol in the UK as well. He's a digital nomad, a social minded founder. And uh, he's what I love. He's a product and experience designer. And as you know, on the Happy Space Pod, I'm going to be looking for leadership examples in that space, form product, service, experience, design, culture shaping, all of that 
to design with sensitivity in mind. And that is what David and the Nook team do. They have a particular focus on a neuro inclusivity as they operate under the mantra of design for the extreme benefits the mean. And so, you know, here's a, here's a beautiful example and you'll hear David expound on that uh, during our conversation. They are also divide, uh, pardon me, they're guided by the UN Sustainable Development Goals in their work to help organizations realize the full potential of their space and the people who are working in those spaces. I love this focus on neuroinclusivity, on the highly sensitive person, on all kinds of manifestations of who we show up as human beings, and this invitation and respect for uh, our diversity and embedding that into an invitation to make our richest contributions, whether it be at work, at school, you'll hear about all the places that Nook shows up and I think you'll be as delighted as I was to uh, listen and learn from David O'Coyman. Today's episode of the Happy Space Podcast is sponsored by ClaireKumar.com. Not only am I excited to spearhead the Happy Space movement, I love coaching busy professionals to achieve greater productivity and well-being. The two go hand in hand. I also adore taking the stage. If you're looking for an interactive, engaging event to inspire and invite action, whether it be on successful work-life integration, sustainable performance, organization and productivity, or expanding inclusivity, please visit clairekumar.com and find out more. Oh, and if you haven't already joined the Happy Space Pod, it's our complimentary online community. You'll find it right at clairekumar.com slash happy space. All right, David. So I am just so happy to have your insights and expertise to bring this Nook Pod and the Nook line of furniture to life. You describe it as a hackable solution. It's, you know, this sensor, sensory sanctuary. It's mindful, mobile, modular, hackable pods and shelters for work, learning, and event space. Can you bring this all to life for our listeners and viewers out there? It's a mouthful, isn't it? There's a whole bunch of sort of pillars behind it. And I must admit, I do pick and choose which ones to bring forward, depending on the conversation, because sometimes it's a little bit too much. But the whole idea basically fundamentally boils down to the world can be a toxic place for introverted brains, for neurodivergent brains, for brains that are particularly sensitive uh, to, you know, stimuli from the environment. And so what I wanted to create, what I set out to create six years ago was a space that would be psychologically safe, a sanctuary, somewhere to recharge uh, both your body and your mind. Um, and then to sort of prepare yourself and ready yourself to jump back in if you would imagine, you know, the world is uh, white water rushing by and it can be, you know, a, a battle to navigate it. And sometimes it's good to sit on the bank <laughs> and just take a moment. And so Nook is about sitting on the bank and about focus and about calm and about mindfulness. So it's creating these little intimate spaces where people can step out and breathe and recharge before stepping back into the world again, be that world in workspace, in healthcare, healing spaces, in education, and more recently in hospitality, even in sports stadia. Oh, we'll have to get to that. I want to hear more about that. But just coming back to this concept of psychological safety, there's a lot in design that we need to think about to keep us feeling that we're not under threat and that we can also know what's coming. So. Um, Nook successfully does that. I want to talk more about that, but also just bring up this concept that I've been building called neurological safety, where, you know, we need to feel safe, but our nervous systems need to stop being under this attack. So from that rushing white water or from intrusive noise, um, visual stimulation, all of these things, and we have such different sensitivities to it that this is, to me, a real example of creating a neurologically safe environment, which is somewhat part of physiological safety. 
but we don't we, we don't think in our world a lot about protecting safety. You know, it's interesting. I was looking at construction sites around here and in the park, there'll be a tree, for example, and they'll fence around the tree to protect the tree roots. And I thought there's very little regard for people and protecting yeah. our ability to stay grounded and upright and, and flourish. So can you maybe, for people that haven't seen Nook before, tell us what it looks like. Give us a, give us a description of the products that you have and what they would look and feel like. Absolutely. And so physically, when you look at a Nook um, straight on, and there's a couple of different models, but the kind of, you know, the main sort of uh, workhorse of the range, if you will, is the huddle pod. So we've got a solo for one person, a huddle for multiple people, and a shelter, which is this hyper accessible, literally what it says, a shelter that you can use with existing furniture, with medical equipment, with a wheelchair, with whatever you want. So if you take the workhorse, you take the huddle and you look at it straight on, it's not an, uh, an accidental metaphor. It looks like a house. <laughs> I mean, it looks like a little house, plenty of room for two people to sit inside without feeling claustrophobic, without feeling on top of each other. Good ergonomic space for two laptops and people to sit at a distance without feeling like, you know, you're right in each other's personal zones, but coldly enough to remove, to, to give that feeling of intimacy um, and to remove the sense of spotlight. The world puts us in a spotlight. The world, you know, doesn't care about spotlight because it's mostly designed by people who are somewhat immune to the feeling of being in a spotlight. Extroverts typically, right? Extroverts go around the world not really caring so much about the sense that everyone can see what I'm doing, everyone can see me when I'm on my phone call, or can look over my shoulder on my Zoom call, or can just look at me whenever they want or call me in the middle of whatever I'm doing, right? So it's a bit of creating this little physical sanctuary space. That is like, you know, when you were a child, maybe if you had uh, two stories, you perhaps had stairs that you could go under or puppies. They like to in a room full of people, they will often go under the table. They still want to be there, but they want to be somewhere that feels like, you know, that they're not being bombarded and that they're safe and they can observe the world in, in biophilia. They call it um, refuge and prospect. So being in your refuge, like a cave overlooking the, the Serengeti, for example, uh, and being able to prospect over that environment. And like you said, you know, feel like you're able to observe what's happening in space. I don't want to leave it. I, I know there's meeting rooms, but that's not what this is. This is something in between. This is like this little physical space that's big enough for me to feel like it's roomy, but small enough for it to give me kind of like almost like a physical hug yeah. and make me feel psychologically and also my nervous system feel like, you know, less attacked in the space. You know, I was observing my cats this morning and the two of them, one was, I have a small, small chair in the bedroom and there are clothes piled on it. And so coming over the chair, it's like a waterfall of clothes. One, one of the cats was under that chair, right? Because of the safety we're talking about. The other one was sitting under one of the plants with all the leaves over it. And the cats will look for times, at times in the day, they'll be on the bed, no problem, or lying out. And other times they want that feeling of being um, less exposed. And, you know, even extroverts, I'm extroverted. And when you're highly sensitive, we've got 30% of people who are highly sensitive extroverts. We still want that. So we know, I, I, and we've talked before uh, about designing, you know, and how we design for the mean or, or the extreme, sorry, we design for the extreme and it will fit the mean. It will take care of everybody. And I think so, even if we've got people that are feeling like, oh, I'm just put me in the center of the room all the time with high sensitivity and with temperament, there are times where everybody wants to go into a safer space. Yeah. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And I use extrovert as an example because it's, mm. it's, it's a gross generalization, but it gets a point across, but to your point, I think it's, you know, we talk about this type or this type and the world is built by this type, right? Yeah. But in actual fact, it's more like a three-dimensional matrix, different types of brains, mm. depending on the environment 
And depending on whatever you're working on, like my brain completely changes if I have a creative task in front of me compared yeah. to an administrative task in front of me. One, I, you know, I absolutely open up like a flower and I become open to all possibilities and alive and excited. And the other one, I physically shrink. I can feel the hair standing up on the back of my neck. Oh, I manage it, obviously. Well, yeah. different people. And I consider myself too an extreme extrovert, you know, who bounces around, stealing energy from everybody. But then I need to, you know, I almost like fly like Icarus too close to the sun. <laughs> and then I need to come cool down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, and I need to tuck myself away. So it's not a this type and a that type. It's really that depending on what you're working on, depending on what the environment is doing to you, depending on your brain type, you know, all of yeah. these things are factors that come into play. Yeah, I love, I love this because I was thinking about myself and my own temperament. I like a lot of silence when, especially if I'm creating or if I'm doing analytical comparative work, most of the time I like a fairly quiet environment. And so I've looked at co-working spaces and I sort of cringed because I thought, oh gosh, yes, wonderful social connection, but where are the quiet spaces? And I think now you can find Nook in some of the co-working spaces. Is that right? More and more. Absolutely. And we're working really, really hard to help co-working because co-working isn't often the most flush with cash environment that you'll find, right? They're often quite independent. They're very um, sort of social minded. Uh, sometimes non-profit or at least, you know, balance profit with purpose. So, you know, working really hard to come to, to tie up co-working with brands that wish to be more visible. So the nook can be brought to you by brand X or with county councils and grant money from government or various funds. So it could be that the nook becomes a place where students can study and then it's free to everybody else the rest of the time. So, you know, there's great, really innovative ways to make product available. It doesn't have to be just straight sales and things like that. There's, there's more ways in the world than that's right. Are, are you finding brands want to be associated with this gift of peace in the day, this gift of this haven? Is that, is that something that's resonating? Usually the goodwill around wellness is, is kind of the buzzword, isn't it? You know, yeah. mental health and physical well-being and psychological safety and, you know, gender equity and all of those things are all fitting kind of underneath the, the banner of, of wellness now really more than anything. So if we can take that and use the fact that, you know, wellness is at the top table in these brands and these organizations to go, look, it really fits underneath this in so many different important ways. It's inclusive, it's wellness, it's mental health, it's equity. It's, you know, it's all about elements. Absolutely taking all the boxes for those organizations then to be associated with. I'm finding there's a lot of hunger for that. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Now, coming back to wellness and thinking a little bit more about the individuals that will really thrive in a nook environment, I know there are numerous attributes that you've designed into the furniture. Can you elaborate a little bit on that to, to bring that to life for us? Sure, sure, sure. So fundamentally, you know, before we add any real special sensory features in its raw form, nook has a scientifically different um, sound pressure inside than it does outside. We do, a, a, we focus a lot on removing high frequency noise. We focus a lot on creating a sort of a low frequency hum within the space. That's, you know, almost audible. You put your head inside and, you know, you can see people go, okay, how is that happening? I mean, I'm in one now, which has a door on, which is the solo booth. And it's the only one we put a door on. The rest of the products are all open for the reason of inclusivity and feeling connected to the environment. So when there's no door and it sounds different inside, people can be like startled and quite taken back by that. So, but after that first, you know, sort of shock, what you get is this, you see this, this relaxing that occurs, this calm that almost, you know, washes over people. So that calms an important first element of the product. But what we also do then is we take lessons that we've learned and we're standing on the shoulders of other giants. I mean, I'm a product designer, so I know that I'm, I'm not the expert. I'm the conductor of the experts, if you will. So we bring experts together and we've, we've worked with experts in sensory spaces for schools. So some of the things we do is like lights really important. We'll adjust lighting in the space. 
for your individual needs in that moment can have a, a fundamentally important uh, effect, not just on your brain's ability to process information, which can be very important if you have dyslexia or if you're in a particular mood and, you know, and that's resulting in challenging behavior, you want to be able to settle, but it can be really important just to feel like the space is yours. Even if it's, even if you're only there for half an hour, adjusting lighting locally and not affecting other people. The zone is very important too, because if I was to, you know, if I was in an office and I was to affect, turn the lighting for myself and everybody else was like, Hey, what's the guy doing with the lighting? Mm -hmm. You're not going to do it. So it has yeah. to be low. It has to be low. And then doing some really special things, like for example, putting vibration uh, in the seat to help people who are fidgeters. Um, so someone with ADHD might identify with this. A lot of movement, a lot of activity, feet always tapping, hands always going, right? I'm thinking, I'm thinking of the Jubilee and right. looking at the Royals and the little one. The little guy. <laughs> he needed a little, he needed a little place for his energy to go other than to, to his mom, I think. And you said it perfectly. You need somewhere for your energy to go because part of the challenge that can occur with that is if you're trying to work, if you're focusing, if you're in a meeting, whatever, if you're in a Zoom call, and all your energy is going into your movement, it's less focused then on what's actually in front of you. So if you can, you know, either put vibration in the seat and it has to be adjustable because you're not going to find one level of vibration that's going to work for everybody. So you have to make it so that people can personalize it. Yeah. Or, you, can, you know, put sort of things like, for example, fidget sticks you know, surreptitiously into the underside of the table. So someone could be fidgeting, but you wouldn't know what they were doing. They're just able to run their fingers or stimming, run their fingers over different materials, you know, feel the tactile element of those materials or be turning or twisting something. Those yeah. things can have a profound effect then on a, a person's ability to then just focus on the conversation, you know. Totally, focus. right? So we look at the Johnny Depp Amber Heard um, trial, right? And Johnny was drawing and doodling. And I think the average, there's a lot of people out there who would think he's dismissing what's going on when in fact that might be his focus tool. 100%. There was that equally video of Amber writing and her pen not touching the paper. So I don't know what was going on there. But... Not, not there yeah, that's that's performative perhaps. But perhaps. It, but the point of sketching, like if I visit, I'm going to use myself as an example. We do that, don't we? We use ourselves as examples. So if I go to a, a talk, and or a meeting even and there's stuff being discussed and I might not necessarily be directly involved in the conversation but I'm just processing I'll be sketching and they might be drawings rather than words it might be words it might be a combination it could just be a doodle it might not look directly related right. but actually that's helping me process exactly. and it's exactly to establish the thoughts in my head in a more concrete way you know so we should absolutely not Quite the opposite to dismissing. We should be encouraging. You should want that information to go in. You should be telling people, do what works for you. And in real meetings, if that means turning off the screen, yeah. right, the video, so that you can, you know, do whatever and not feel self conscious or whatever, if yeah. that'll help you engage, then that's what you should be doing. And that's what yeah. we should be encouraging people. That's that's the conversation I have at the beginning of the the workshops and things that I lead is like, you you need to know what you need in this moment. And if you're speaking to us, I would love your camera to be on, but otherwise, please do what you need to do. And yeah, this understanding that productivity is personal and it looks different. I think that might help people like Elon Musk perhaps be a little more generous in his, thou must work 40 hours in the office and then you get the right to work home. Like, you know, some blind spots I think still exist. He's doing what all management do. What most people do is looking at the world through a prism of their own experience. And so it's when you step outside of that experience and you start to empathize with different types of brains and research and understand it a little bit, you start to realize that in actual fact, I'm curtailing. I'm curtailing those around me and the potential of the world and civilization, even if you want to take it bigger, by, by, by applying my metrics onto what my team should do. Hey, here's, here are the lessons that I've learned. Yeah. And by all means, in part, the lessons that you've learned. But if you're going to dictate that people need to follow the path that you've followed, then you're going to end up with, I don't know, like, you know, how many people are exactly like you? Well, that's how many people are going to benefit from that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So thank you for echoing that because that came up recently and I was just like, oh, come on. <laughs> and so there's, you know, I think 
through getting Nook out there and people understanding the features and the elegance in the design and all that research that built that's built in, I'm hoping it's going to further the understanding of all these different work natures and experiences that people really need to benefit from. Um, that's so, what I hope to do. And, and I honestly think that you know, it doesn't have to be complicated. There's, there's a fear about getting involved in this area of messy human nature. Leave it to the HR people, let the designers do the design thing. But in actual fact, part of the reason you mentioned hackable right at the start, and it's a little bit of a, what does that even mean? But the whole idea of hackable is all around this concept that we can't even pretend that we know what a space has to be until it starts being used. You can use all of your experience and you can design a space to be what you think it needs to be and you can make it beautiful and they'll take gorgeous photographs and be very happy with how it looks in your portfolio. But the moment it starts getting used is the moment you really understand that it probably needs to change and what parts of it work and what parts of it don't. Yeah. And if it isn't hackable, if it isn't modular, if it isn't changeable, if there isn't flexibility in it, and if you can't empower the people using it to make those changes, it won't succeed in the way that it could. And that's what I'm about. I'm about the way that it could, not just a little bit better, but the, you know, maximizing its potential. And so if you can build in elements where people can take and chop and change and do things and evolve and give, empower people to do that, they start to own the space and feel responsible for it. And, you know, and they'll help the developer space and to help other people use the space. And you can do simple things, Claire. It doesn't have to be expensive. Like you talked about co-working and people being anxious about going in and it being noisy. Where's my quiet space? Mm -hmm. You know, the best advice I can give to, for example, co-working or anyone thinking about setting up a space like that is think about two things. One, get a piece of paper and print library area or quiet zone. You know, it costs cents on the dollar to, to print a piece of paper and obviously perhaps you should do it in a better way than a piece of paper but all you have to do is put up a sign that says go ahead don't <laughs> right right you can, that's all you have to do and the second is make sure there's places where people can sit with their back to the wall because yes. there is this tendency to make these common spaces with long tables and common and interaction and we want to drive creativity and we want to drive collaboration but by taking away safety and taking away people's walls you actually drive collaboration down. Mm -hmm. So if you give people somewhere where they can sit with their back to the wall, they will then be able to observe and decide when to engage. And then they're more likely to engage other than rather than just put their headphones on and say, okay, this is and, safe. And, and email the person directly beside you. Yeah. Right. I am. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, you're right. The, stu the studies show collaboration actually goes down in that open concept environment. And the pressure on women actually went up to dress to be seen in the office rather than, you know, I, I have a hashtag now speakers and sneakers because I'm all about ditching the heels and being comfortable and getting things done. So, you know, it's, it's challenging. It's allowing for the challenging of social norms and you know, taking out microaggressions and just this design of that safety is, is so paramount. But you mentioned fear and you mentioned there's a lot of fear. Is that the biggest challenge for organizations in coming to A, understand what's required here and then move with confidence into this discovery and fluidity and, of design to really find out what their workforce needs? Yeah, fear is an absolutely huge factor, but it's a huge factor in everything we do, isn't it? We're usually anxious about being judged. We're anxious about, you know, short and long-term judgment. And that comes with, you know, um, investment in space. And right now there's never been more fear than ever, you know, and in, you know, if I make changes now, are those changes going to be applicable in six months time? Because, you know, we had to close our offices. We had to put plastic between everybody. We had to limit the amount of people that were in, you know, all these changes. There's a lot of risk aversion right now in investment, in making those changes in workspace. And at the same time, there's a lot of urgency about making change because workplace really does recognize that it needs to change. So there's a real torsion sort of happening between those two. I've got to change. I've got to make this place more hybrid is the, uh, is the buzz phrase, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Um, and oh, but if I make those changes and those changes don't work out, that's lost revenue, that's lost budget. That's, you know, uh, my reputation might, might be at, at risk. So there's a lot, um, there's a lot riding on it, but I think the way out of it 
is to show two things. One is that it's easier than you think. And two, that if you don't make those changes, you're leaving so much on the table. Like your organization's intellectual property, your productivity, the engagement, building friendships, you know, turnover of staff is all shown to be predicated on friendships in workplace. And if the workplace is, is creating anxiety, people are being less open, not making those connections with each other, not staying longer. So you'll train them and then they'll leave. So it feeds into all of that really positive stuff. And if we can open that up and show you know, with these small changes, you can make big improvements then I think that's that's our path forward. I think it is. And I think you, you lay it out really well. So I'm hoping that anyone listening who has the opportunity to influence a conversation about the space, invite those, those people that you can influence to listen to this interview because it hopefully will plant the seed that productivity is personal and we need these options. And then Nook has some of these options which are just so thoughtfully designed. Um, there's so much gold in, in the way this has been developed and can be implemented. I'm wondering if you can share some examples of implementations now in the world that uh, you're really excited about. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. And I have to say, you know, the last um, six months or so have been sort of extraordinary in terms of the development that we've seen both in workplace, uh, in education. Um, and I mentioned briefly there uh, in hospitality and in uh, Stadia. And one thing that sort of, you know, there's a couple of things that jumped to my mind. The first one is we put, um, we put some Nook into a hospital recently in uh, Scotland. And I reached out to find out how things were going. And uh, the feedback I received was something along the lines of, one of our nurses reached out to me recently and said they were having, uh, they had someone who was having a really challenging time and the Nooks had just been installed. So they brought the person to the Nook for 15 minutes and it resulted in them leaving in a much calmer state. It resolved at least the worst of the situation which was occurring. It allowed them to sort of recenter themselves, to feel calm, to feel like, you know, all was not as, uh, uh, as, as, uh, 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 at a loss as, as they were feeling at that moment. And so they were able to then re-engage in their work and go back to providing care uh, for others. That was a staff member. Wow. And when I received that, yeah, I have to admit, I had, you know, kind of hair standing up on the arm when I, when I read that from a healthcare professional to say, we, this, came, this thing came in, we, we recognized that it had the potential to be, you know, an intervention, a mental health intervention. We brought someone to it and in a very short space of time, we saw the impact that it had and it had a really positive outcome. I was like, that is phenomenal. And then a couple of weeks back, um, we also, uh, one of our uh, sort of recent successes and very pleased to see the sort of feedback that we're getting from this was at City Field um, in New York, where uh, the Mets um, play baseball and they uh, incorporated a uh, Nook sensory pod in there for people visiting uh, on match day. And the flood of positive PR that that got, not just in the first instance, people saying, this is great, finally, you know, to have spaces like this for neurodivergent people, but for everybody as well, to be able to bring people to the game that they might not otherwise have. But then also in the weeks afterwards to say, we tried it, this worked. I would have had to go home because my child or my sibling or whatever, well, my partner yeah. had this, you know, neurological event during the game where it all became too much. We mm -hmm. went and sat in the nook and they were able to rejoin and, and enjoy the rest of the game instead of otherwise having to go home. And that's what I want. I don't want people to have to go home and I don't want people mm -hmm. to think I don't want to go there because there's nowhere safe for me. I want to be able to, in the, you know, enable these spaces shopping malls, workplaces, education, whatever it is, where people can feel like I can go there because if I need it, yeah. there's a resource. Oh my gosh. So twice this week, I went out for dinner and the restaurant got so loud. After two hours being there, I had to, I had to leave while my partner was still say, paying the bill. I had to leave because of the noise levels. And because the chair was so uncomfortable, it was one of those low profile chairs that hits the upper back. And the lower yeah. back has nothing. And I'm like, that's, this is the ergonomics are bad. And the, the sound was just building and building and building. And I just reached the point where 
I'm really tired. I need to go out. And then last night I was, um, there was a speaking meeting and it's the first time we're getting together in two years. And I didn't have enough information about the venue to know that it was going to be safe for me to go. So I didn't go. Then right. when I saw the images, oh, it was a quieter room. It was, it was, we were told it was at a restaurant. Well, they have meeting rooms as well. So I think there's something too. Perhaps there's a, 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 a neurological or psychological safety rating for spaces that mm -hmm. people can know, oh, there's, a, there's a, a huddle zone here or there's a calming center or something because, yeah, somebody having a panic attack, there, there, that's where you go and that's where you can, you know, yeah. restore. Yeah. And there's fun, uh, like, you know, you know, Nook isn't maybe necessarily going to work in these instances. And I want to be clear, like, I don't think Nook is the solution to all things whatsoever. It's an ingredient of, yeah. but, you know, the part of the solution is to look at the sound profile in space, look at where are the options, look at, you know, are there, is there choice in the apartment? Mm -hmm. Because a one size does not fit all. Mm -hmm. A one size fits the average and the average is very few. So if you give people, and the choice could just be where you sit. Right. So, you, you know, there could be areas that are clearly quieter or the whole area could be treated in such a way that if there were more curtains or more soft materials, or soft furnishings, or if there was some treatment on the roof or if there was some white noise or if areas were slightly divided up into noisy and less noisy, you know, yeah. all of these things. And, and there could be nooks or there could be built in. And by the way, if you ever walk into a space that has those kind of little alcoves, they're the first things to fill up. So why don't we have more of those types of things, right? And eventually, I think spaces may hopefully be built with these things included. But until we get there, <laughs> there's a, there's still a long way to go. So the idea with Nook is that it's a very retrofittable thing that you can easily add to a space. But ultimately, I'd like to see them on the blueprint. I'd like to see Yeah, no, I, yeah. But, well, and that's, and there's an awareness job here, right? And that's part of what I'm hoping to be part of is spreading the, 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 understanding that we need to create these different choices and options and this is an element to to do it affordably now without having to, to you know take a hammer to everything right but to instill sure. this concept of designing for the diversity that's there the nook to me is a real inclusivity tool as indeed as it's meant and i think as well you know you think about designing you know with those things in mind and you talk about the cost this is also a, what do they call it? A, re, a return on investment or total cost of ownership play because these things save money in the long term. Better experiences, lower turnover of staff, you know, increased engagement, higher IP in the organization. These are investments. Yeah. The costs are low and they're returning, you know, 10x, 20, 50, 100x down the road yeah. because your environment, your organization is more successful, whatever that organization is, whatever its purpose is. Well, let, let's talk practically for a second where, where your understanding of where the market is right now, if somebody senses that, oh my gosh, this is what we need, they've got facilities to talk to, HR to talk to, um, who is listening and what arguments or valid points should someone go in with to have the most success? I imagine it's going to differ very much so, uh, depending on the organization's organization. I don't think Elon might be listening so well right now to this, but. And the size of the organization will have an impact too, because if it's a big yeah. organization, there may be an employee committee, there may be a DEI department, there usually will be HR, there'll be facilities. So you're either talking to, you know, if it's the small to medium enterprise, you're talking to the owner, you're talking to the office manager, you're talking to, I think the future role we're going to see an explosion in is a uh, something called community manager. It comes from co-working. Yep. So it's less about pens and stationery and more about interactions and community, right? Keeping the people <laughs> and, happy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly that. So I think you're talking to community manager, you're talking to HR, you're talking wellness and you're talking sustainability. So the big ones that we talk about are yeah. flexibility, wellness and sustainability because everyone is interested in those points at the moment. Right. Depending on who they are, they'll be more interested in different points, right? So HR will be yeah. more interested in wellness than they will perhaps in sustainability. Of course, they're interested in sustainability, but I just mean in terms of strengths of interest. Facilities will be interested in flexibility. Mm -hmm. They'll be interested in repairability, interested in, you know, uh, greater use of space. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, they'll be interested in all the elements that make their job easier, basically, that help them to achieve the outcomes that they're striving for. So it's a little, it'll be a little bit of a horses for courses, depending on whether it's a HR wellness, mental health, inclusivity ear, or whether it's a practical space, flexibility, risk aversion, <laughs> all of those kinds of things. And those are almost sort of the two categories, I'd say, if I was to make it as simple as I could, that they fall into. Yeah, I think it's, that's wonderful. You've given people who are listening a set of parameters and, and support to maybe uh, excite that first conversation about having a safe place to be at work. And really, you know, the reason I didn't want to go into the office, it, it was too overwhelming. So having that safe place. And also, I just want to make the point that it's for the huddle, for sure, it's not a safe place in the dark because you are allowing all this natural light in there. A lot of phone booth type applications I saw maybe 10 years ago were, oh, you want to think? We're going to put you in a tiny space with no light and uh, come back, you know, come back out of your solitary confinement when you're ready, right? So, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and I think more help on the way, right? I mean, um, you know, in the US, you've got uh, the Trauma Informed Design Society who are working hard to create guidelines to help organizations starting with schools, but building towards workplace, give a set of not guidelines and not, you know, tips and tricks, but more of a, a process for how to figure out how to make your space more you know, um, neuro inclusive. Um, and then here in, on this side of the pond in the UK, the British standards organization have brought out a new guideline called design for the mind, making space more neuro inclusive. And so that really goes through, I mean, it's incredibly detailed. I was delighted to see that it includes, um, HSP, highly sensitive people, something that you're hearing more about was sort of one in four are said to be HSP. So. I think these guidelines are coming. HOK architects have been banging this drum for a long time and yep. create amazing guidelines and research. So there's stuff out there that you can reach for, you know, that you can, you know, that gives you some, some tips. Think about this, think about this, think about this. You're not alone. You know, whoever's listening now and thinking, how do I take steps forward? There's <laughs> lots of us thinking uh, along these lines and there's lots of guidelines coming out to help. So what an optimistic note to finish on. And I just have to hearken back to the episode two with HOK's Mary, uh, Mary Kate Cassidy and Kay Sargent, who are pioneers in this space and doing great work as you are, David. And I, uh, yeah, I invite everybody to dig in a little bit. Stay tuned to the future episodes of the podcast. We'll be, I'll be exploring that British standards uh, design for the mind that includes HSP, because I will say that a lot of the forays I've made into understanding how people are talking about the neurodivergent population HSP is missing from the the equation. They're saying, you know, it's largely drawn and driven from the autism community, expanded into ADHD, dyslexia, and then other challenges. And they're saying it's one in seven. And I'm like, no, it's way more than one in seven. Um, the numbers are, yeah, one in four, one in five, somewhere in there. But then we have all the situational challenge that's right. causing sensitivity. We're all in, there's a little PTSD after the past couple of years. There's traumatic brain injuries. There's it levels of anxiety. And all of that, whether you're highly sensitive by nature or not, are all modes of being sensitive that we need to really make room for in our world. So, so David, thank you again for joining me. And I encourage all listeners to check David out. We'll put links to Nook, Nook Pod um, on, uh, in the show notes. And please check David out and his work. And if you think this is something that your organization needs to hear about, then please uh, share it. Yeah, let's move the needle because I think the time, you know, the change moment is now. And we need to grab it while we can. There's never been a time where employees are more empowered than they are now. So we need to use this moment. We really do. <laughs> That's right. All right. Thanks so much, David. Thanks, Claire. Take care. Thank you so much for listening. You can find all of the Happy Space Podcast episodes over at happyspacepod.com. That is also where you'll find a link to our online community. Please leave a review over at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you tune in. And if you liked what you heard, please share. After all, doesn't everyone deserve a happy space? <laughs>